without taking more time, I would like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker. So we have our keynote speaker with us, a well-known uh, personality who doesn't need any introduction. Rehan is an entrepreneur and investor. It's a privilege for B-Side Islam, but we have him as a keynote speaker. Uh, Rehan is the CEO of security.ai, which was named as the most innovative startup of 2020 by RSA conference. He previously ran the cybersecurity business of Semantic. He was the CEO of Plastica, which was acquired in uh, which was acquired, and also CEO of Wireless. Rehan was named Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist in 2010 and top disruptor in 2015. Rehan is also alumni of NED University, Purdue University, and Howard University. Today, he's going to highlight the importance of cybersecurity and trust, the guardians of digital economy and prosperity. So let's begin. have a very high regard for this community, of course, this global community. And uh, I was very happy to see that it's such an organized thing that is going on out of Islamabad. Uh, so uh, the other thing I just want to highlight is that instead of, I thought, making it more like a one-way keynote or, or just uh, some statements, it will be great if it can be uh, more of a conversation, uh, which means if you have questions, uh, please do ask. Uh, so I can give you a little bit of my view on our purpose as a community, a cybersecurity community uh, in this world and how I see it, what inspires me, our team, our, our, my fellow colleagues, and I'm, I'm sure you guys, but it'll be great actually this could be a, a conversation in which you can ask questions and I'm, I'll be happy to answer to the, to the best of my abilities. So um, before I jump into uh, you know, cybersecurity and privacy and so forth, it's always good to understand, like, why? Why we do, the, do what we do and what impact it has on the rest of the globe, not just in one country, not just in one city, but actually, and things that we do, we, um, it, it better have impact across, across the globe. And I think that, let's talk a little bit about that first. So a few questions to ask, key questions, I would say why we should be in cybersecurity? Why me, my friends and colleagues here, and of course this community, um, what is the purpose that we serve? Um, within cybersecurity, where we see uh, it needs to be more and more innovation needed. We can talk a little bit about that. And uh, third important topic, of course, is privacy. Uh, why this is such an important topic across the globe um, where the data uh, of people, uh, it needs to be kept private and uh, why it actually has a huge implication on how the world may actually, uh, may look different if there, there's no privacy around this. So we, the three key topics, simple, we'll keep it to that. So let, let's, let's talk about the, the, the why part first. So just stare at this, um, this graph. Imagine in your mind, like what, what is this graph about? And I use this actually quite a lot. Um, and this simply represents the world GDP in trillions, right? And this is uh, by economist uh, Robin Hansen, uh, one of my favorite plots to look at. The few numbers for you to think about, the doubling time of world economy uh, in the hunter-gatherer society was about a quarter million years, right? It took about a quarter million years for the world economy to double. And of course it's an estimate, but simply really mean for prosperity to double, uh, for people to come out of poverty or people to come out of, uh, you know, have a better life. That took about a quarter million years just to double that, right? Then farming societies came along. It uh, dramatically changed to about, let's say about a thousand years, you know, radical shift. Um, but the, one of the biggest shifts that has happened is information age where the prosperity or the world GDP can actually double within the, within a decade, and it's even further accelerating as we going towards more automation, AI, uh, all kinds of automation that actually is, is going on, and it does actually have direct impact on the prosperity um, of, of the people around the globe. Yeah. So what happened? Um, this this graph, this line looks, of course, you know, went straight up. There's a curve around here. So let's zoom in and see what happened in this particular time frame, right? 
in this time frame, uh, imagine in your mind what, what, what innovation happened in that time frame. The steam engine came along, and of course, it literally uh, changed the way in, in which uh, humans could do things, could be more productive, right? And then, lo and below, electricity and motors came along. Uh, all of a sudden, now people are even more uh, you know, productive. Um, and of course, you can see the world, uh, world economy and prosperity kind of changing and people living kind of a, a better lives. The fundamental shift started happening with the computers. Uh, and even further, I would say, uh, when they got interconnected. Uh, and then you can see the line goes kind of a, almost like straight up. Uh, when everything got digitized and everything got you know, interconnected, uh, the world became kind of a completely different place. And the, that's where you see the, the GDP kind of doubles every, every 10 years uh, because of that. The, um, and, and this prosperity is, which is enabling all this communication that we're doing right now, all the commerce that happens in a way, all communication that happens this way, all education that happens this way, um, although open source software that gets developed one place and gets used somewhere else, all the collaboration that happens this way. Um, it has, of course, um, it, 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 people who, of course, you know, want to use uh, this as more in a malicious way or actually want to attack in a malicious way. And that's something that is really under attack. This prosperity, this new system uh, that has enabled so many people to be living in a different way. That is something that, that is a stake in all aspects of it, and you know better than me. And if this community, if they can be guardians of ha having the trust that has been established and uh, in this particular information age uh, and keep it secure, um, it is a, is, a, is a great purpose. It's a great cause to be actually in this, in this profession. And I'm sure it keeps many of you um, excited about it, um, becomes more like a mission, not just a job, right? I'll give you a little bit, of course, another example. Um, physical security versus cyber security. In a physical security, in a traditional sense, it used to be a time when, you know, one person could steal another one person, or maybe one person could steal, a, you know, a, a bus, maybe, you know, dozens of people together. But when it comes to cybersecurity, we all know the mass uh, thefts and mass damage uh, can be invoked by this uh, by the software, right? So uh, having these checks and balances in place to keep the system going and enabling this uh, information age, I think is something that keeps all us all of us going, right? So let's let's talk about now all aspects of uh, information information age. Whether it is, you know, now we talk about cloud computing, it's IoT, it's uh, the auto, auto, automated cars, every aspect of it, um, wherever there is software running, uh, that's actually a, at understate, right? So other, other thing you, we, all, we all know, cybercrime, accordingly, you, you're seeing the cybercrime kind of uh, uh, growing at literally at, even at the most petty levels to actually at the, at the state level. Um, and by one estimate, as we know, uh, that's close to, you know, half a trillion dollars worth of uh, cybercrime economy. And of course, speculation is uh, that this itself is, has become bigger than uh, drug, tra drug traffic, narcotics industry itself. Um, so it's not that um, the economic incentive of people actually trying to abuse and of course, you know, um, um, steal information and actually have ransomware, all that is actually the economic incentive is extremely high. Uh, and no wonder, you know, we see all these incidents that's like kind of going on. The, um, I will kind of give you a little bit of data and this is from the World Economic Forum, just to give you also the what is really at stake and how even the global leaders kind of see this cybersecurity uh, and some of you may have seen this is actually from this, this year from World Economic Forum. Um, if you see here on this chart, this is of course the global risk landscape of 2020. Like across the globe, if there were to be certain risky things, what would those be, right? 
And according to the World Economic Forum, things, of course, which humans would not be able to control is climate action failure or extreme weather conditions, which we will not be able to actually, you know, if that happens, it's a huge risk for the humanity. They put literally um, and natural disasters right there. And cybersecurity is right around, the, around there. You can imagine how it is perceived as such a big risk to the system that has been established because of which all the commerce happens and everything, the way of life actually happens. Uh, if this is compromised, the global risk is extremely high, right? And if you can see some other aspects of, uh, of the cyber risk, data fraud, data theft is also put as, is very high uh, in terms of likelihood of that happening as well as impact. You can see the likelihood of that happening and impact both are extremely high here, right? Literally, you can also see that infrastructure breaking down, you know, some sort of, you know, we infrastructure not working, likelihood of that happening is much, much less versus because we know their adversaries are there uh, at the state level and all would, would, would want to be. Uh, you know, compromising these things. And if you look at the way this trending, um, you look at the scale of four and the way it is trending uh, at, the straight, uh, at the scale of four, cyber attacks, the, the, the probability of, and the impact of that is actually, is gonna be even more disastrous, literally touching, you know, our inability to actually take action on the climate change or action that we would need to be taking to you know, stop uh, the climate change from actually having the, the impacts it would could have. And similarly on the data fraud and data theft, it is clearly, you know, there is uh, impact of that and the likelihood of that happening is also kind of going up uh, in all these studies and, and surveys. And the, what is the reason of it is, is actually very obvious. More and more of data and more and more life is, you know, being digitized. Um, and more and more of new ways in terms of, you know, we know artificial intelligence as much as we want to use on the cybersecurity side, uh, cyber criminals are also in all aspects, uh, of course, using to actually make sure that their systems uh, and, and uh, are also much more intelligent than just not basic scripts, but they're also self-learning and they adapt uh, along, along the way. Um, so I think that's really is part of the reason, as you can, you can see, it inspires a lot of people to make sure that they are on this side of the equation and uh, they are basically the guarding the system uh, along the way. And that's kind of keeps, keeps all of us going. And as, as I said, um, please feel free to keep posting questions. I'm, I'm going to basically, after some time, I'm going to stop. And you know, if you have questions, we'll address it and have a conversation. Um, and that'll be a lot more fun than just me talking. And uh, feel free to add in comments if you if you don't have actually any specific questions. It'll be make make it a lot more uh, a lot more fun. Um, I think we all know uh, you can you can every piece a piece of thing that you touch, whether it is uh, you know now in all the switches and light bulbs, um, everything <laughs> that you use actually it has software. And wherever there is software, there is risk. There is cyber risk. Uh, even if there's like a little tiny piece of software, there could be a, a cyber risk. I mean, then you can easily assume that that's, good, that's going to be there. Uh, often you will see that, you know, we were at RSA, or all of, many of you have been at RSA. Uh, also, when you go there, it feels like, you know, there are like thousands of companies, uh, you know, at least a few thousand companies actually show up there uh, who have some role to play. And often people say, look, there are too many companies. Well, frankly, really think about it. Uh, every aspect of life actually has a very different need on cybersecurity. Uh, if you talk about IoT, you have a very different stack and you want to secure it in one way. If you go towards cloud computing, you have SaaS, you have, of course, you know, the IS infrastructure. Within that, there are so many different components. Like, it's such a complex environment. If you go towards, of course, more automated cars, um, uh, and if you go to, you know, uh, healthcare, you would see cybersecurity has so many different specializations. Hence, you will see a lot of innovation actually comes from smaller companies, comes from smaller group of people who are experts in their respective areas and they would want to innovate and they you know, start something. 
you almost can you can say that almost there is no other landscape in industry where um, a consolidation doesn't happen uh, here. Consolidation happen very it, even if it happens, there's new issues that pop up. There's new way of uh, doing things that pop up um, in, in 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 the technology side of things, and new need of cybersecurity kind of come along, right? And we've that we've seen the transition uh, again and again and again, and it is not going to stop. Uh, I think so. That's why if you also have aspirations to, you know, build something on your own, start something on your own. This is again one of the best places um, to be not to be too worried about the large companies because not many large companies can continue to innovate in all aspects in all areas um, of cybersecurity itself. Right. So um, within within uh, of course uh, cybersecurity in different dimensions of it, uh, I think we can we can spend a whole day kind of talking about it. Uh, you know, where are the kind of new avenues coming? Um, uh, and many of you, of course, you know, must be um, engaged with, you know, many different aspects, whether it's from IoT to cloud to, um, you know, healthcare to, you know, various different things. Let's talk a little bit about um, the, the fourth industrial revolution. What are the biggest things? Again, this data is coming from the um, World Economic Forum also. But 2025, cloud computing, uh, is going to be one of the, the most massive kind of markets. And within that, of course, it all gets bundled in as SaaS, uh, you know, you get private cloud, you get public clouds. Within that, you have all kinds of storage, from networking to compute and all kinds of things. Uh, it simply represents that how central the cloud computing is going to become for all verticals, like all kinds of businesses are going to be running on, on the cloud, on the public cloud itself. Uh, and securing it um, is going to be, you know, a amount of innovation that is needed. It's just, we're not just done. Uh, this is a journey that is going to continue, right, for quite some time. Same, all the revolution that's happening in autonomous anything. Instead of saying cars, it should be autonomous anything. Cars is certainly there, but uh, also, you know, how the things get stacked and shelved in, in, uh, in grocery shops to uh, how things get delivered at home. Uh, how maybe the delivery within a restaurant it happens, they're all going to be autonomous, right? Also, all going to be software running, and um, that itself is a huge market. And there are so many different flavors of this autonomous everything that you you know. There's an opportunity there to continue to kind of you know make it secure uh, and protect it. And medicine, uh, precision medicine, within that there'll be equipment, uh, there'll be software and equipment uh, running. Um, and th that's where, you know, directly you can see uh, life and death um, is going to be at stake. Uh, and drones, as we know, uh, where you do not want a drone to be kind of hijacked and kind of acting against you. And if actually are there some uh, adversarial drones out there, uh, how do you actually protect, even physically, how do you actually protect them? And this is a whole new area, uh, which we already know uh, there's a lot going on in, in that area at the state level. Um, the, the, the key point being that there is cybersecurity is not just one thing. Uh, there are so many different specializations and flavors um, that, you know, depending on, uh, you know, what your aspirations are, you, of course, you could probably pick your path already on these things, right? Let's talk about a bit about where does the, uh, the privacy uh, fit into the picture? So uh, before we even go uh, and talk about privacy in the digital domain, um, privacy is actually a fundamental basic human right. Uh, and why is that? It is not just because internet is here, now we're talking about privacy. Even US constitution, uh, you know, which was written in you know, hundreds of years back is literally, is a basic human right. It's written that way, right? And, and reason is very simple that you, every human being that lives, they want to live a you know, private life. They don't want uh, interference. Uh, they want freedom. Uh, and, and especially from, I would say, uh, more powerful organizations out there, um, which, which actually a single human being has no match to, whether it's the government, uh, which can have too much knowledge uh, about your daily life and it can interfere. We will talk about that. It has happened multiple times, many, many, many times in genocides and all, uh, where uh, explicit data collection about humans and how it was used against them. And now we know uh, it is. It can be used by you know, commercial organizations against you in a variety of different ways, right? 
Um, and those ways are very, very, you know, simple. There's a fairness. If you, if you're getting credit or get trying to get an insurance, um, you know, uh, and if all data is out there, it can be used against you. It always can be used. It can be biased. It can be biased. Uh, you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to get, you know, basic healthcare or um, basic credit or or basic education, where it can be used against you, and it's extremely important. And no question, safety. Even in physical con constructs, uh, if people who want to be acting as uh, malicious against anyone, having uh, knowledge about a specific target, it could actually uh, put them in, in like literally physical, physical danger. Uh, if we take that construct and apply it in digital domain, it's even more dangerous because now um, the monitoring upon it, individuals, whether at the state level, government level, um, or if the commercial organization is doing it, is so darn easy uh, because everything that we do, uh, the way we live life, everything is come you know through our machines through our cell phone or my computer or my car and all this data uh, is collected somewhere by each and, and not just collected it's exchanged it's sold uh, okay, forget about advertisements it's, it's it's basically used to influence you uh, into a variety of different ways whether it is influenced in a, you know in purchasing decisions or your voting how you vote uh, how you pick your preferences you your mind can be played with based on based on this data. So, privacy. Uh, it, no no wonder uh, the privacy has become one of the hottest topics um, in the in the in the frankly globally because people are kind of realizing that too much data and too much power is, is sits with uh, in commercial new commercial organizations like Google's of the world and Facebook's of the world and you know uh, Amazon's of the world. Um, so if you look at the sentiment about privacy, um, Global Shapers is again this year's uh, respondents. Uh, and of course, short-term risk outlook, loss of privacy and loss of privacy to government and loss of privacy to companies, both are rated as extremely high. You can look at, you know, where it stacks. It's among, amongst, among top 10 things extreme heat waves and disruption of ecosystem. And in that same line, you will actually have loss of privacy. It's that high. And I think it's obvious why that is the case because you don't want you know, control um, of extremely powerful organizations uh, on individuals on how they live their lives, right? And why is that though? If you go back in history, the data collection, um, you know, this is a blatant example of using data to then target and, and physically harm, kill and uh, communities. And this, this happened, uh, you know, not, this is not just one example, there are examples after examples. There's a huge role of data collection in genocides where you first have to know exactly who to target and data is collected. And then some bias is, is created, whether it is based on your race, your gender, whether it is based on your beliefs, your religion, uh, whatever that be, um, you know, and, and, and the data, uh, that collection has uh, played a huge role. And hence, privacy is, is absolutely one of, one of the, the most important topics of the times because data is so easy to collect um, at this point, right? Uh, here you can see, this is literally the, the sheet where, you know, this is, you know, where prior to the Holocaust, uh, how data gathering exercises were, were there by the, of course, by, by the governments. Um, and um, so, and, and of course we're gonna, we can again talk about like, what needs to be done there, how the, uh, the, the people should own the data, uh, their own data, rights to the data, their rights to go delete the data, rights to modify the data and rights to know exactly who's it being shared with and stopping all of that. And, uh, and if they remove the consent or that, that's been given for the user data that, that basically data doesn't get used against them. Or So I think you, there is, there is um, definitely a lot of new technology that needs to build, build to actually give people the rights on the data, not companies and governments actually having 
uh, uncharted rights uh, on people's data because it literally is their digital life. Data really means it's their digital life in somebody's hands, right? So I think, let me pause here. Um, I know we, we have uh, uh, some time, we can actually talk a bit about if you have any comments, please make any questions. Um, I'll see if I can have the, uh, the questions here in this or somebody can actually tell me what questions came along. Uh, yes, Rehan, uh, thank you for that. We just have a one question. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Cool. I, I, we have just one question in our Discord channel. Uh, they're mentioning you are a privacy champion. So you mentioned about everything is going, you know, digitizing, starting from, a, you know, the shopping cart, you know, up to going to the autonomous cars. So one thing is like the country specifically where they have GDPR laws and the privacy laws. So definitely, you know, they try to protect their customers' data. But the countries where they don't have any privacy laws, even not even the cybersecurity laws are, you know, applicable. So how customers uh, should be enforcing, you know, that uh, their information should be protected. If banks are asking, if telcos are asking, if uh, you know the uh, car sharing service is asking you know, their information, how they can make sure their information is protected? It's actually it's a, it's a really a good question because if you really think about, it, especially in some countries, um, the monitoring on individuals is just insane. I mean, you have to give your fingerprint. You go buy you know buy, buy a little small thing or go or something. You have to give your fingerprint. It's, it's not something you can change very easily if it gets stolen or it gets compromised, right? Um, I think. You, the way it has happened, GDPR didn't come along by itself or CCP didn't come along which government wanted it. Uh, it came along because people wanted it. It was about awareness that people acquired and had understanding of how this data can be misused. You should really see a, a movie on Netflix um, called Social Dilemma. Uh, it just came along. I think it'll give you a little bit of a, a deeper insight of how this data gets used and there's activism that happens where uh, people like yourself and all who got more who are more educated around how the misuse of this data can happen by the governments and by of course uh, the commercial organizations uh, and frankly commercial organizations often they collect data and they have no understanding of how to protect it they'll collect hordes of data and often get compromised and at the end people suffer uh, and activism is the way uh, because there is a template established now with GDPR, CCPA, LGPD, what's happening in country after country after country, they're looking at these templates, they're basically gathering around it and then uh, asking their governments to actually build regulation or they're basically putting these things forward. That's the way it's happening. In India, you're going to see a regulation, uh, private data uh, regulation uh, going into their house uh, perhaps next, next quarter. And same can happen in, in, in Pakistan also. You're seeing that happening in, of course, other you know, Middle Eastern countries that you have new regulations that are um, uh, coming along. And it's, it's primarily driven by activism. It's primarily driven by because people really care. And if you do care, then you, know, you should assemble and, and frankly educate others along the way. It's not gonna happen automatically otherwise. And if it doesn't happen, there'll be no rights. Like, nobody would care if, there, if it's not a regulation. Thank you, Ram. Uh, we have another question as well. Uh, they're, ask, they're asking, I see that you have been quite successful in your InfoSec career. You have worked in many companies like uh, different companies, Elastica and other companies as well. How long you have been in this cybersecurity game? How long is, did it take you to take the idea of privacy ops and, uh, and you know, uh, and should, you know, say, you know, how you turned into a company actually? Yeah, so um, I think, when if you if you look at turning into a company is um, first look at what problem you're trying to solve right and if that problem that you're trying to solve first of all if it is real um, and if it is a broad market if the impact we talked in the earlier slides we talked about how, how much impact it could have on the globe uh, how many people it could actually benefit which literally people talk about the market size but maybe instead of looking at it from the market size perspective you say how many people I can actually benefit? And if these two things line up and the solution that you can bring into the market, if it is differentiated, it can stand on its feet, um, then you actually have a chance of making it into a commercial enterprise, right? Um, and, and in case of uh, security.ai, it, it grew extremely fast. Uh, the company is still very young, um, but right out of the gate um, within first year, you know, of course we were able to launch five, six products because the market need was there at that time, clearly. Um, and company got, got recognized 
by even by organizations like RSA, which is cybersecurity, uh, the, the largest cybersecurity kind of a gathering, uh, as the most innovative company, uh, you know, this year. So um, why? Because it was very simple. There is clearly a market need. Uh, a team that was able to pull off and you know build a certain kind of solution. And I think that's the template that you really could try to solve big problems uh, with the differentiated offering. Uh, and if you execute, that's a commercial enterprise for you. Uh, there is just no other secret to it. It's a, a straightforward process, I would say. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we have another question for you. It looks like questions are coming now quickly. Uh, you mentioned about the cyber crimes. They have been acknowledged globally. And, uh, you know, cyber crimes, uh, we saw some, you know, the recent activities in Pakistan as well, specifically ransomware, other activities against critical infrastructure. Uh, some data loss happened with the banks as well. So the question is, as we have seen so many data breaches, both in the past and the present, what are the reasons customer privacy is not seen as important as other countries uh, in Pakistan? Why is not taking so seriously and important in Pakistan? I think it's clearly, um, it's clearly the uh, awareness. Um, I think, so um, first I would say, even from the cybersecurity side, there is almost no awareness. Look, you guys are the specialists in this area, so you understand what the kind of damage is. You know, one theft, you somebody can actually take out millions of people's of data. If the one get, uh, bank gets compromised here, you know, millions of people's of financial data could go out. Well, thank you so very much. If there are no other questions, um, I really appreciate you inviting me here. Um, and uh, good luck with the rest of your conference. Thank you, Ryan. It was really an influential session, and it's definitely important for us and everyone to understand the importance of cybersecurity and trust to protect our digital economy and prosperity. That was really a very important topic close to our heart, and you covered everything in depth and breadth. And uh, yep, it was honor for us to be, you know, to be you having a keynote speaker in our first B-sides happening in Pakistan. Thank you for taking time out. Thank you so much.